So hi, everybody. Wel welcome to this week's SP Grid weekly webinar series. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have Brian Hernandez Garcia and Jorge Roel uh, for, to talk about from the, the Bonvin group at Utrecht University. Although if you were joining in early, they may, are physically in different locations in Europe. And today they're, they're here to talk about light dock, which they will be happy to tell us about. And I'm interested to hear about because I looked at the abstract. It's like, this is gonna be a fun one. So with that, I will turn it over and we're gonna be starting off with Brian. So if you'd like to share your screen and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Pete. So good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for being here. And thank you, the SB Grid Consortium, for organizing these webinars and for inviting us. I'm Dr. Brian Jimenez, and I will be talking today about uh, a software for macromolecular docking, which is called LIDOC. So first part of the talk, I will be in charge of that. And then the second part, it will be uh, driven by Dr. Jorge Ruel. So I will leave the floor after my part. So this is going to be uh, more or less the outline of uh, my talk. Um, we will start with some context, uh, talking about what is uh, macromolecular complex prediction. And then we will go into the, into the details of what is LIDOC, uh, why we call it a, a framework, uh, some basics. And then uh, Jorge will be in charge of the, of the last part of the talk, we will be like, practical applications and, and some future and perspectives. So starting with the first part, um, the macromolecular complex prediction problem. So proteins are, are the molecular machines of the cell and starting from the genetic information encoded in the, in the DNA molecule inside the, the nucleus cell, um, this information is, is transcripted and translated into different uh, amino acids. I'm pretty sure that you are uh, aware of this and you already know it. Uh, this uh, first very long string of um, amino acid uh, sequences uh, coming from the DNA, it's then uh, initially packed in regular substructures. Uh, this is what we call the, the secondary structure. Here we are talking about beta sheets and alpha helixes. These uh, substructures are then uh, reorganized in what we call the, the tertiary structure. Uh, and this three-dimensional structure of the, of the proteins, uh, it is that moment when they start to interact with other partners. And this is what we call, and we define as the quaternary structure of the, of the protein. So proteins, uh, they come in very different uh, shapes and sizes. So here there are a few examples, such as the monoglobin uh, G, insulin, some um, bigger as the glutamine synthetase. And very, very hot in Twitter last, last week is this uh, amazing cryo uh, resolve structure from the bacterial flagellar motorhood complex, which is uh, basically the, the, the way uh, such the, the, the bacteria is moving uh, through the flagella. So it's amazing uh, the, the amount of different monomers that are uh, resolved through cryo-EM, and this is uh, this is a record in the in the field right now. Uh, we are talking about the macromolecular docking problem, which is uh, very easy to state. So starting from the different partners, so different copies. Here we have uh, a final complex, uh, emagglutinin, which is a uh, uh, very similar to the spike protein from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, for example. So starting from uh, three different copies of each of the partners, then we end up in this uh, solving this puzzle into the final complex, which is a homodrimer uh, uh, a complex uh, concerning the different structures. So more in detail, uh, I was I was saying before that uh, macromolecular docking is. Uh, very simple uh, problem to state, but indeed it's a very hard optimization problem uh, in terms of uh, computation. So here we have, um, we are talking about different paradigms to try to solve this puzzle. So 
are we considering only these partners as rigid poly partners? So they are like rocks and they, we try to make them interact or they are flexible. Indeed, these structures, they are, they are dynamic in nature and they are composed by uh, a lot of different atoms and they are moving. So um, here we are simplifying, we are using this rigid poly paradigm, but the flexibility indeed adds uh, a lot of different degrees of freedom to the, to the computation program. So we can talk here about the bound docking versus unbound. So if the structure is free or bounded to another structure, then it's going to be different in terms of computation. So we have to deal as well with some regions which are disordered and, and th those uh, kind of proteins, uh, intrinsically disordered proteins, they are very, very important for many uh, cell cellular uh, processes indeed. And at the moment we are not uh, doing very well in terms of uh, solving this, this problem computationally speaking, then we can have like multiple binding signs. So different proteins interacting with other partners in different uh, places, uh, multiple docking when we are talking about like not only two partners, but more than two partners interacting at the same time and counter complexes, and then introducing other kind of molecules such as DNA, RNA, uh, cofactor, glycan, science, etc. So um, for that purpose, so solving uh, these structures because we want to understand which are the details, the, the structural details of the different uh, proteins that we are studying, we can try to solve them experimentally using mass spectrometry, X-ray, NMR, but some of these experimental techniques, they have limitations in time, in size of the proteins, and for that purpose, there's uh, the computational side of the, of the problem. And then we have some different disciplines such as docking, molecular dynamics, or morphology modeling, trying to also solve um, the structures or give some insights from the structural uh, point of view about the, the complexes that we are studying. So um, say it so. Let's go into more detail in what is the, the LIDOC framework. So LIDOC is a software which is based on, a, on an algorithm that is called global swarm optimization, which is from the artificial intelligence uh, family. And we are using the metaphor of the of agents in the algorithm, which are glowworms. Uh, so we are inspired by nature on how these glowworms um, they interact with each other. So depending on the light that they emit, they are going to attract more mates or, or, or less. And in using this metaphor in nature, if we imagine that the, the energetic landscape of the, of the protein docking uh, problem is, is in 2D like this. So if we place those agents in, the, in this funnel, in this energetic funnel, so this guy is going to be uh, the best in terms of energy. So the, the more negative, the better. So using this algorithm, uh, the blue guy is going to be attracted towards the pink instead of the, towards the, the gold, yellow, because the energy of, of the pink one is better and it's emitting more light. So using this metaphor, what we, are, what we have is something like this. So we are representing a possible pose of the of the receptor here in white and different poses of the ligand. So, so the colors are the same for, for the glow worms here. So the blue guy is going to uh, go towards the pink and in the process, it's going to sample this part of the landscape. So this algorithm is dynamic in, in nature um, such as there's a vision range uh, towards the different glowworms they are seeing each other's. So depending on this dynamic vision range uh, and depending on the energy of the previous steps, those guys are going to sample different regions of the energetic landscape. So this is basically the, the rationale behind uh, LIDOC. And we are encoding, uh, so receptor partner here is, is in blue and ligand partner is in, in orange. So we are keeping fixed the receptor at the center of origin. And then we are using the translation vector 
from the center of or, uh, the origin uh, to the uh, ligand poles, to the center of the ligand poles. And then we are using quaternions, which is a very nice way, which is also uses, uh, used in, in games and giants for uh, expressing the, the, the orientation of the ligand. So this is going to be this GI, the optimization vector, if we are in the rigid body paradigm. But we can also model uh, the flexibility of the backbone using uh, the nosotropic uh, network model, so AM modes. And then here we are adding, which is uh, the extents of the harmonics for the receptor and for the ligand. So we can disable or enable uh, depending on the amount of flexibility that we want to model. Uh, in both receptor and ligand uh, partners. Um, so before starting the simulation, we place uh, over the, the, so imagine here that the receptor is in blue, is uh, um, here depicted. So we place different points over the surface of the receptor, which are these uh, uh, orange points. And each of these points is a swarm. Um, a swarm is uh, a set of different glowworms, so agents of possible poses uh, of, the, of the receptor ligand pose. Um, these swarms, they represent uh, an independent simulation. And this is very nice because uh, depending on the granularity of the, of the swarms over the surface, then we can extend to bigger complexes, for example, and then we can keep sampling uh, uh, in a good way the, the, the receptor surface. Second slide here, uh, only one swarm is depicted. So only one of these uh, orange points. So we have depicted all the glowworms uh, within this swarm. And they are using this uh, three axis, so uh, red, blue, and yellow. Okay, So they represent the different poses of the of the ligand uh, the ligand part sorry uh, towards the receptor. This is a very old movie, but I think it's very nice. And this is the process how the different glowworms they sample uh, uh, according to a, a scoring function uh, according to the energy, this energetic uh, protein landscape. And you can see here, so I'm sorry, it's, it's not so fast, but then you can see how each of the globes is optimizing towards the, the, the best energetic solutions uh, found so far. So if there are like new positions with better energy, then all their neighbors, they are going to see it and then they are going to, uh, to move towards uh, this new solution. Uh, if we represent this very uh, exact uh, optimization that we uh, saw before in the, in the movie, so we are going to get some uh, landscape like this, like this plot. So for this complex here, uh, we have depicted all the possible um, poses uh, sampled during the, the protein docking. And here you can see the different funnels. And here we have put, um, we put, um, uh, orange line uh, depicting which are like the the acceptable solutions in terms of uh, energy and uh, and the ligand. So we usually say that below ten Armstrongs of uh, ligand RMSD, they are very close to or near native uh, solutions to the compared to the crystal. Okay, so here we are calculating towards the reference that we already know. Um, we call Lidoc. Uh, a framework because it was uh, developed uh, with Python 3.6 and it can be easily extend uh, upon the different uh, user needs. So it's very easy to add new scoring functions, uh, new force fields indeed. Uh, there are a few uh, scoring functions already um, coded for you, such as DFAR, DFAR2, PyDoc, Toby, and so on. And this way, uh, here with this mechanism, we can allow users to to develop their own uh, scoring functions, or to use multiple force fields at the same time, etc. So 
Apart from that, there's local minimization uh, support for the best solutions uh, upon docking. There's the share and distributed memory support. So we support multi-processing and MPI, depending on the on on the hardware that you want to execute this. And there's um, there's a GPU version now on, under development um, at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, by them and and with some collaboration with Nvidia so far. And here, apart from Python, we are also using Python and the, uh, and the Python C API for, for better performance of the code. So let's go into some of the basics of how to use uh, LIDAC for your uh, use cases. So this is basically a summary of the different commands that you have to execute for a, for a simulation. So the first command is the LIDAC setup. Then once uh, the system is already uh, configured, then you can uh, run the simulation using like a three uh, .py command. And then once the simulation has finished, you can generate the different conformations that they have been uh, predicted by the uh, by the software. And then you may cluster them and I will explain later. So this is basically basically the, the, the main workflow if you want to use uh, LIDOC. So uh, first step is the setup. So here I'm going to distinguish between two different versions. So version 082 is the one that you already have in SV Grid, but there's a new release and I will explain you which are the, the difference between them. And well, at some point I have to talk with the SV Grid uh, people to, to release this uh, new version into the SV Grid uh, community. So basically uh, for light that setup, what you need to provide is uh, the PDB structure of the receptor, the PDB structure of the ligand, uh, the number of swarms that you are going to use uh, during the simulation and the number of glowworms. Those are like the basic arguments that you have to uh, provide to the, to the command line. But as well, there are many other details uh, that you can add to this setup. So uh, we usually, we have been benchmarked uh, uh, the, the LIDOC software for, uh, in a benchmark that is called the Protein Protein Document Benchmark 5. So those are usually the, uh, the, the best parameters that uh, we use. So 400 swarms and 200 uh, glowworms. And then if you put the flag uh, AM, this is going to activate the flexibility in both receptor and ligand. Here we are going to use the first 10 non trivial normal modes. And then many of the scoring functions, they, uh, they need uh, some uh, atoms to be removed. And for example, here we are removing the oxygen terminals of the, of the chains and also the hydrogens, okay? So depending on the scoring function that you are going to use uh, during the simulation, you will have to uh, set a different uh, flag here. So this command is going to generate uh, a set of uh, several folders and, and files. The most important ones are uh, the init folder, which contains uh, in version 0, uh, a 2 it contains uh, uh, a special file that is called cluster centers, which indeed is uh, in PDB format is going to show you uh, the position of the different swarms over the over the receptor surface. There's a set of JSON uh, special file that I will show in the in the next slide, and then there's the structures parsed by LIDOC software for the receptor and for the ligand partner, and then depending on the number of swarms that you have specified here in the simulation, they are going to be here at the, sa the, the same number as the swarms here, so different folders. Those are the folders that are going to contain the different uh, outputs of the simulation. Of course, uh, here I'm just uh, pointing out like the basic stuff, but you can go through the lighter.org tutorial and basics, and then you will find all the different details of the different uh, parameters of this command. 
In this new version in 090, so the number of swarms and the number of glowworms is not required anymore. So by default, the, the easiest part, the number of glowworms is going to be 200. This is because we are always doing that in our, in our uh, published uh, work. So this is going to be something that uh, this is not going to be a, any more a problem for the user. So it's, if you want to specify it, you can do it uh, with the with this uh, sorry uh, with this minus s uh, parameter. But also the the big difference here is the number of uh, swarms is going to be calculated automatically depending on a density of swarms over the surface. So this is very new to this version. And we have been tested it, and it's working quite uh, nicely. So we recommend to add it to this version and to let uh, Lido calculate automatically the number of swarms depending on the size of your receptor partner. So same as before, the files generated, but the cluster centers is now uh, better called swarm centers. Okay. And then you have in this setup to JSON, you have all the information that the software is going to use for the simulation already in JSON format. So this is uh, very nice uh, in terms for reproducibility purposes, because if you forget at some point which were the parameters that you use for the simulation, you will have all of them here in this setup.json file. So for example, if you want to visualize the swarms, you can use Pymo. So always use the LIDOC receptor structure because it has been moved to the center of origin. If you are using the original structure, then the swarms are going to be translated. So they, they are not going to be depicted in the, in the correct way. But if you open this init folder, swarm center.pdb file, then you can see all of these uh, uh, swarms calculated for you in PDB format. Uh, next step is, is running the simulation. So you have only to use this command like the three.py. So very easy to use. So indeed, it only requires, which is the setup file. So the setup.json file that was generated before in the previous step, and then the number of steps that you want to simulate. Okay. Of course, you can specify more things such as, for example, which is the scoring function that you want to, to use for your simulation. By default is, is DeFi. Um, you can also specify the number of cores that you want to use if you don't specify it. So here, for example, we say two cores, but here we are not specifying. So let's use all the available cores, for example. You can also enable MPI, depending on the, on the way you are going to execute this. If you're using a slower uh, queue system, for example, and also, you can simulate a specific swarms. So for example, if you want to test something quickly, you can simulate only uh, here, I'm saying 0 and 1, but this is a list. So you can specify uh, many swarms that you only want to simulate here. Of course, um, this is a very experimental feature, but you can uh, use several scoring functions at the same time. And then LIDOC is going to ponder them so here we are using two different ones that are called zipper and DFAR. And then it's going to apply this weight, 0, 08 to DFAR scoring function and 0, 05 to zipper. So for example, if there is one scoring function that is using uh, Van der Waals, but the other is not using it, then you can combine them, for example, and, and at, the, at the simulation time to sample different regions of the energetic landscape. Um, as well, so as the setup uh, step, we are also generating a light.info uh, file, which is incorporating all the different extra information from the simulation in, into the setup.json uh, file. So if you are running uh, several simulations, this is going to be uh, one, two, uh, number appended to the to the to the end of the name of the of the simulation file, but you are always going to have this uh, all the parameters already stored for you to check in the future if you need it. Um, 
Once the simulation has finished, then it's, it's time for generating the different predicted models. So basically what we are going to do is to generate the PDB structures predicted by, by LIDOC for the simulation. So in, in a given swarm, so swarms are starting from zero. So the first swarm is swarm zero underscore zero. We are going to generate the, if we, are, if we use 200 glowworms, so the agents of the algorithm, uh, for the simulation, we have to generate these 200 predicted models because there's going to be one model per, per agent, per glowworm in the system. And then uh, we use this command, LGD generate confirmations. We use the uh, original structures that we use uh, during the setup, to set or PDB, they get PDB. And then which is the, the final output. So every 10 steps of the simulation, uh, there is going to be uh, uh, an output file for each swarm generated. You can keep the last one, but if you want, for example, to generate the trajectory of the different glowworms, you can also uh, get the information of the different uh, uh, intermediary files uh, generated by LIDOC. So how does it look, uh, this output of LIDOC? So here I'm, I'm only showing the, the first two lines of this uh, output file. So the first is the header, okay? But here in colors are depicted the different values. So for each line we are going, so this is a very long line, sorry. So we are going to have for each glowworm, the different values of the optimization vector, which are the, the coordinates here. So we have the translation vector here, the quaternion um, components, and then we have the, the harmonics of the, if we are using uh, flexibility in the background, for the receptor, the harmonics for the ligand, and then in the the, the last uh, field is going to be the, the score, okay? Which is this is basically the the scoring coming from the from the scoring function that we are using during the simulation. Finally, we have to um, do some intra swarm clustering because uh, due to the characteristics of the of the global swarm optimization algorithm, um, there's a lot of uh, redundancy on the predicted models. So basically we have a, a lot of different uh, glowers that they have converged uh, into different local minima. So in order to, to avoid redundancy in the structures and to, to facilitate this analysis after, we are going to remove redundancy from the from the, the output of LIDOC. So we do that for each of the swarms. So we use this command, which is LGD cluster BSAs. And then we give uh, the, the final output of the, of the simulation. And then for example, here for this uh, swarm zero, the first swarm, we have this uh, special file cluster dot rep with, it is including, uh, so we, so, 200 structures they have uh, converged here into three different clusters. So we are using a cutoff of the, of the total RMSD of four Armstrongs. So, and then we have uh, the different values of this uh, file are the, the cluster ID, the number of structures that they have uh, clustered, uh, which is the best score and which is the global ID of this score. And then which is the, the final Best uh, structure in, in PDB format. So, all uh, LightDoc software is online and under GPL uh, version 3 license. So, it's open source and free to use for you. Um, we have a very good coverage here, so close to 95%. So, we are always uh, including new code, but always uh, testing it. Uh, accordingly, and we are supporting from Python 3.6 until the last version. And you can also find, apart from SVGrid, uh, the releases here and also in PyPy uh, online directory. Uh, to sum up, there's also a new version of LIDOC, which has been uh, developed uh, using the Rust programming languages. And it's, it is, uh, so far, 10 times faster on CPU compared to the best, um, to the 
to the best uh, code so far for a given scoring function in the in the Python version. And more important, we are using less than two orders of magnitude in terms of memory. So as you know, Python is very uh, memory greedy. So using Rust, we have uh, uh, diminished a lot this uh, memory consumption. And this version, uh, uh, so far, it only uh, it's using uh, well. It only there's only default scoring function available, but we are planning to add more scoring functions here. And then the most in, uh, computing intensive part is going to be in the future in Rust, uh, while all the setup and uh, all the different scripts are going to remain in Python. So now I will leave the floor to my colleague, Dr. Jorge. So yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm gonna now show you a few examples on how you can use LIDOC in your research. But first, let me uh, tell you that LIDOC can incorporate information about binding sites. And this information can be used uh, on the receptor here in blue on, and on both uh, receptor and ligand. On the receptor, what this information will do is to filter out all the swarms that uh, are not close to the residues that you input to the algorithm. So in this case, we see that uh, these two swarms are generated according to these two different residues on the receptor. If you use information on the ligand, what it will do is to orient these uh, initial configurations of the glowworms in order to face the surface of the receptor. So we uh, somehow ensure that uh, there, there's going to be a contact uh, um, with that information. And also, this information is used in the scoring. So the score will be adjusted uh, based on the percentage of satisfied restraints. And therefore, it will play an important role in the optimization uh, process as well. So first, I'm going to show you um, an example by using different levels of data. Uh, in the benchmark five that Brian uh, mentioned before, as compared to uh, blind simulations, which are uh, simulations without uh, using any information. So for all the results that I'm going to show uh, now uh, are going to be based on the success rate here in the y-axis, which is defined as the percentage of cases for which we find at least one near native model uh, within each of these representative tops. And these tops are a kind of ensemble like a solution um, that in the case of the T1, top one would be the best scoring model from LIDOC, the T5, the best uh, five scoring models uh, from LIDOC and so on. So in this case, we see that uh, without the use of information, there is a moderate uh, success rate uh, of about 30% for the T uh, top 100. But um, we wanted to evaluate whether including just one residue on the receptor had an impact on the success rate and this is what we call T01. Uh, so we basically selected one residue that was uh, in the interface on the receptor and do the docking of these uh, 55 cases. And these are the results. So we see that already by including one residue, there is an increase in the performance of about twice the success rate as we, as we had before. So now we are close to 60 in, uh, in top 100. Uh, but as I said before, we can also use this information on the ligand, so in both. So for the third case, we selected a uh, receptor ligand pair. So uh, one residue for the receptor, one residue for the ligand that were making a contact. And now there is a big improvement in, in, the, in the success rate. And then we see also that for already the top uh, 10, we have the, almost the maximum success rate. Also, the different colors in the bars indicate the quality of the models uh, according to the Capri criteria. Um, this is assessed by um, comparing our models uh, against the crystal structure. And the more green we, uh, means that the more close to the, to the reference. So in here, just by using one receptor ligand pair, we uh, start to see that LIDOT can generate already a high quality models for a run, I would say 15% of the cases. Oh, sorry. Uh, the next case uh, will be that we selected all the residues belonging to the interface from the receptor and we use them for the docking. 
and then we see that of course there is an improvement uh, according to the blind and we also wanted to see which is the maximum that you can get from from lidoc so uh, basically we selected what we call the true interface which are the all the uh, residues that are in, co in contact uh, from both receptor and ligand and we see that um, we are almost able to generate uh, near narrative models for the totality of the cases uh, already in the top 20 and i think that we are here missing like one or two cases from this uh, 55. however this data is not always very accurate so it might include uh, information about residues that are not part of the interface so we wanted to test whether lidoc was still able to yield uh, valuable uh, predictions uh, when using partially incorrect data. So for this, uh, we took all the residues that we use for this case, and we basically clustered them into two or four different patches. And then, for example, for the 50%, so we uh, selected as many residues as the ones in, the, in that patch and then perform two different simulations using these two kind of synthetic interfaces. So basically, we have two cases where uh, in the uh, tree interface rec 50, we have 50% of wrong information. And in the uh, T uh, tree interface rec 25, we have 70% of wrong information on the receptor. And surprisingly, we are still uh, able to uh, generate quite some uh, near native models. Uh, and we have a better success rate that uh, compared to blind simulations. And we also did these experiments by uh, taking the, the full picture of the true interface. And we have basically uh, the same message that we are still able to uh, predict models even with incorrect information. So the two things that I would like to highlight from these results is that overall we've seen that the use of uh, accurate information increases the modeling performance. So this is very important. And in particular, uh, we've seen that LIDOC still gives valuable predictions with incomplete or partially incorrect information, which I think is very important and could be very useful for uh, potential users as well. So the second case that I'm gonna show you is about antibody antigen modeling. Uh, antibodies are Y-shaped proteins um, and they are composed by two pairs of heavy light chains. So four different chains uh, that we see here. And these chains are stabilized by uh, disulfide bridges. Um, in order to function, antibodies interact through the uh, CDR loops, which are also called hypervariable, uh, hypervariable loops. And this is uh, some information that we can already use into the modeling. So, uh, and there are different uh, levels of data that can be incorporated. So we can use, for example, just the CDR loops of the antibodies and no information on the surface on the antigen. Uh, we can uh, still use the same information on the, on the CDR loops and also a loose definition of the uh, binding site of the epitope. And we can use uh, what we call the true interface, which is uh, the perfect information. So now we see uh, the results for each of these three different cases and comparing for different uh, software on 16 antibody antigen cases. So the success rate uh, are defined as before. So the percentage of cases for which we find one uh, native model uh, among all these different representative tops, which are the same as before. And each of the different rows uh, represent each of the three different scenarios that I explained you before. Um, and in general, what we can see is that uh, every software uh, benefits from the uh, inclusion of of information if we compare the different tops, uh, sorry, the different plots from top to bottom. And also, since today we are uh, talking uh, about LIDOC, we can say that uh, LIDOC is performing quite well when uh, there is even, uh, sorry, either uh, no information on the antigen or uh, loose information on the antigen. So basically, this kind of mimics uh, the different cases that I showed you before. So these results are pretty much consistent. Um, yeah, and this is the, the, the conclusion that I, that I just told you. And the very last example uh, that I'm gonna explain is the um, 
a very recent protocol that we designed for uh, membrane docking. So trans uh, there are two main types of uh, transmembrane proteins, which are called alpha helical or beta barrel, depending on the uh, secondary structure of the of the protein. Um, more or less, just one uh, percent of the PDB corresponds to this membrane protein. So this uh, clearly indicates that uh, these are difficult targets to study experimentally. And also, it is estimated that 60% uh, of all drug targets are membrane proteins, <clears throat> which indicates the, the importance of these proteins in, in health. So for that, we designed a, a, a protocol, and then we start by selecting a representative cross-grain snapshot from the MemProtMD database. So MemProtMD is a database that runs molecular dynamic simulations into a transmembrane proteins in order to place them inside the membrane. Uh, so we select the, uh, and, and a snapshot from, from that data, database. And then what we do is to replace uh, the cross grain receptor by the atomistic one, because we are going to do uh, all atom docking. And we also remove all the bits uh, representing uh, the lipids, but those uh, corresponding to the phosphate groups, because these are somehow uh, the most external layers of the membrane. And this is indeed the kind of information that uh, we are interested in here. And then third, uh, having uh, our receptor already in the membrane and also knowing that the ligand is a soluble protein, so we can already discard regions uh, uh, for the sampling that we know that are not going to be part of the binding interface. So since we know that uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the ligand is a soluble protein, we can target the sampling basically to the extracellular loops. So these are the swarms that will be generated uh, for this particular case. And uh, the last step is that we select the top 100 complexes generated from LIDOC and then we refine them with HADOC in order to remove uh, potential clashes at the interface and also to improve intermolecular uh, interactions. So we tested this protocol in 18 different uh, membrane uh, complexes that are classified into three different categories that we have in here. So we have A, what we call antibodies. If uh, the ligand in blue is either an antibody or a nanobody. In B, we have the beta barrel category if the receptor is a beta barrel. And then we have the alpha helical, which are uh, basically the rest of them. So now we see the results for uh, each of these uh, different categories, as well as uh, an overall one. So the success rate and the tops are uh, as before. And um, the colorful bars indicate the results uh, for our membrane protocol. And then the gray bars indicate the results of our blind uh, protocol, which uh, um, without using the membrane into the docking. So the very first thing that we can see here is that there is a huge improvement uh, in the success rate when using the, the membrane into the docking. And specifically, if we look at the antibodies, we see that our protocol is able to generate uh, uh, near narrative models for uh, the totality of the cases, which are six in here. So the message will be here that the topological data that uh, is encoded in the membrane really makes the difference uh, in, in our case. Um, knowing this, we wanted to uh, evaluate uh, the impact of uh, different membrane definitions in the performance of the, of, the, of the docking. So we have four different cases here. Uh, membrane is the regular membrane protocol that I just explained you. Then we have average, which means that we took the average coordinate of all these gray bits and then we created a flat a membrane. Then we have minimum, which is basically we took with the, the minimum coordinate, which in this case would be this one, and then we created also a flat membrane. And in here we see that uh, as long as you go down with the membrane, the number of swarms increases. So we go from uh, almost uh, 100 to 128 and then 158. So, and as the number of swarms increases, also the number of false positives in this case. 
And also we wanted to see whether um, the penalty that we apply to the models penetrating the membrane was helping in the optimization process. So for this, what we did was to do the setup uh, that Brian explained before using the membrane, but then we removed the membrane during the docking. So uh, meaning that the ligand uh, was still able to bind in these regions while, for example, in this case, those poses uh, would be very much penalized. So now we see the results of these uh, four different uh, um, cases. The, from left to right, we have membrane, the average filtered, which is without the use of membrane and minimum. And then we see that indeed, if we take the representative snapshot from the membrane in the, uh, we have um, the better success rate. But also interestingly, if we compare uh, our membrane protein with the filtered one, which means that we don't use the uh, membrane for uh, penalizing these models, uh, we see that it really helps uh, both with the sampling as we have uh, quite a significant difference in success rate in here, but also in scoring. So it is quite important for us. Um, basically, these are the two uh, messages that we can uh, say from here that indeed penalizing uh, these models penetrating the membrane leads to better predictions as we see here, and also that the position of the membrane it is important and therefore uh, the orientation of the lipids. And as a bonus track, and I'm happy to say that we uh, have a beta version of a web server for LIDOC. Uh, you can already access it in here and try it, but uh, I say that it's beta version because at the moment uh, we don't have a lot of computational resources, so we are still not um, ready to release it publicly, let's say. Um, we have also implemented a minimization protocol of the uh, top 10 predicted models using OpenMM. And we have a very, very nice visualization uh, using Mostar and NGL. Um, we have also implemented a user a workspace where you can keep track of all the simulations that you've done and, and look them again. And with this, I would like to thank all the CSP group in Utrecht and especially Alex for uh, all his support and, and advices. Uh, I don't want to forget mentioning uh, all the funding agencies that made this work possible. And of course, thanks to SB Grid for hosting the, the software and also for providing uh, several software that we indeed use for all the analysis that you just saw, and also for uh, having us here uh, with you. And with this, we uh, are happy to take any question. All right. Thanks, Brian and Or. That was, that was a very interesting talk, both, both parts of it. And if, if folks have questions, you can either send them to me or Jason in the chat, or you can use your raise hand icon and unmute yourself and ask. I've, so it's, a couple questions came through. And I guess one, so one just to, to clarification question for folks that may less, be less familiar with the optimization part, but the, the coordinates for the, the glowworms in the swarms that is in optimization space rather than three-dimensional protein structure space. Is that is that correct? Mm, that is correct. So this is all managed by the optimization protocol in it. So this right. is not something that the user has to give to the protocol or whatever. It's automatically calculated. Great. And Jason, you've got a question? Uh, Jason, you're still muted. Sorry, I double clicked my mute. So, so I, uh, I just had a general question about what can users expect for the uh, computational requirements if they wanted to sort of dock two of their favorite proteins of interest based on both, uh, you know, maybe uh, the sizes of the molecules, the sort of computational resources they might have. Are we looking at like hours on a desktop, or do you need a cluster, or do you need specialized? Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I will go for that, Jorge, if you don't mind. 
So um, basically, as I was seeing in the in the first slides of the protocol, you will see that uh, each swarm is an independent simulation. So basically, one independent simulation is a, a core that is being used for for LIDOC. So depending on the amount of cores and the number of swarms that you have available, then you are going to simulate this in more or less time, basically. So um, there's a nice improvement on, on the speed up of the, of the overall protocol with this Rust version. And for the moment, for example, in, in this virtual private server that we are using as the, for the beta server, so we are only using 10 cores. So basically that would be like similar to a desktop machine nowadays. So protein peptide, which is a, a very small peptide, let's say nine residues, 10 residues, it's going to take one minute and a half or less of computation time in 10 cores, okay? So if you increase, so basically the, there, there are two problems here in terms of uh, computational time. One is the receptor size, which uh, the bigger, the more swarms that are, you are going to generate. And then, because you have to sample more surface of the receptor, but this can be um, uh, decrease if you, for example, add some restraints. So if you add restraints to the receptor side, then you are going to filter out all the regions that are not important for the sampling. Okay, so if you are going fully blind docking, then of course you are going to use the, the, the overall surface and then the, the general number of swarms. So I've been benchmarking this on the protein protein benchmark five, which contains very large molecules indeed for the receptor side. And then we were generating 1,200 swarms, more or less for the bigger uh, molecules. So if you are using 10 cores and you have like one minute, two minutes uh, per simulation, then you can do some maths. This is going to take some time for sure, okay? But there's also the, the information because the receptor is kept fixed, but the ligand is the one that is moving. So all this information of the different atoms rotating and translating, so this is like uh, more memory that you have to use. So more memory, the more copies that you have to do and the more time that it's going to take. So the computational time also depends on the size of the ligand, okay? So for example, as I was saying before, for protein peptide, this is going to be super fast because the peptide is very small. But if you are taking like two proteins, uh, so for medium, small medium proteins uh, on the server, this is going to take on 10 cores from 15 to 20 minutes, including the, the final optimization on OpenMM which is quite fast indeed. Um, of course, this depends on the, on the size of your, of your complex. So I can give you more numbers. So this is one of the things that I really want to put online at some point because we have recorded all this thing. And I think it's, it's a very useful information for the users. I guess one other question related to the, the, the compute requirements is if you, if you had a, a light dock run where you wanted to run 300 simulations independently, is there, assuming you had the logistics set up, could you conceivably run those on a couple hundred different systems independently and just do the combination step at the end? Yeah, absolutely. So that okay. would be possible indeed, yeah. That, that, that's how it looked to me, but I wanted to make sure about that. <laughs> Great. And I guess, so one, one last question for the, the interest form clustering. Have you? It, would there be any benefit to including the the spread for the score distribution inside the cluster, in addition to just the the best score and the size? Mm, I don't know if I'm following you. So can you repeat the question, please? Ah, so for for the this, the the clustering, you've you've got, you were saying there's the minimum score or the best score, the cluster yeah. size. I'm wondering, is like the average score for everything in the cluster or the standard deviation meaningful? Yeah, that's one of the things that we explored a uh, long time ago uh, when we were developing the protocol, but we have been stuck to this for the moment. So that's one thing that probably we could explore for sure. And probably it's, it's going to, because in the end, swarms that are very close in a space, they are going to, to give similar solutions probably. Yeah. If they are I mean... converging to a similar space. So 
another um, stage of uh, further cluster after this intraswarm, that would be also nice. And then you are going to reduce um, a lot, probably the, the number of structures predicted by, by LIDOC. There's also um, a collaboration with a, a former colleague from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, he is using machine learning, a machine learning uh, model for risk scoring. And we are getting very nice results on that. And then coming from less information from a better clustering, that, that could be improved for sure, the, the protocol. So very nice point indeed. So yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something to consider in the near future, yeah. Thank you. 